A year ago, a massive earthquake hit the city of Padang here in Indonesia. Over a thousand people died as a result. Homes and lives were destroyed. Now, experts are predicting an even bigger quake could hit this region at any time. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. On this edition of 101 East, we ask if Indonesia is prepared for its next natural disaster. Indonesia is known to be the most natural disaster prone country in the world. And this city of Padang is especially vulnerable as it sits on an active fault line. And yet the fatalities from last year's earthquake was as much blamed on human error as it was on the natural disaster itself. Drew Ambrose reports. Arda Edward, West Sumatra's disaster manager, can see the scars from last year's earthquake even before leaving the office. His agency survived the 7.6 magnitude tremor, but 100,000 buildings around Padang collapsed and 1,100 people were killed. Ternyata dari studi from our observations and research, what killed and injured people here was not the earthquake, but unsafe buildings. We've got to build safer buildings. This family saw firsthand how unsafe Padang's buildings are. Rosmiati was playing here with her children when the earthquake hit, mere metres from her grandmother's house. There was a loud noise like a bomb. Water was spilling out of the well. And my children were running towards me for safety when the big tremors happened. And then I remembered my grandmother. Rushing in, she found her grandmother crushed to death under a fallen brick wall. Rubble remains as a sorrowful reminder. But Rosmiati is determined to rebuild her own house properly as she waits for government funding in this Red Cross shelter. Everybody wants safety for themselves. I want a house that's foolproof from the earthquake so that we can stay permanently forever with my family. Earthquake educator Jason Brown was part of an international team that examined 4,000 collapsed houses. We found uh, foundation work was poor and basically the other really important one is the roof wasn't uh, connected to the rest of the structure. So when you get an earthquake you had a roof moving one way, you had walls moving another way and foundations moving another way. It's a recipe for uh, disasters. Villagers learned from Jason how to rebuild quake-resilient houses using concrete columns tied to the roof with steel. Safeguarding Sumatra's buildings is crucial because seismologists predict a larger 8.9 magnitude quake could hit within a decade. The particular area around Padang, we, if we look back in time, we can see there have been almost identical type of events to those that are happening now back in time, 1797 for example, and we can go further back in time as well and see the previous times this has happened. And so it's not like we're, we're saying, oh, this might happen or something like that. We know it does. An early warning system monitors activity along a 5,000 kilometre fault line where tectonic plates grind together, triggering big undersea earthquakes such as the Asian tsunami every 200 years. Padang sits right near the only part of the fault where tectonic pressure continues to build. Professor James Goff is among a number of international experts who predict a tsunami will follow the quake. They say the land is being pulled downwards as the Australian plate is being forced down underneath the Sunda plate 
and then suddenly what will happen is eventually that plate will say, I've had enough of this, and it bounces back up again. And that's what happened in 2004. It's what happened in 2005. And that whole bouncing back up again is happening on the sea floor. So suddenly the sea floor will go up 5 metres, will go up 10 metres. A tsunami could hit these shores in 10 to 15 minutes because of Padang's proximity to the predicted earthquake epicentre. So authorities need a swift evacuation plan for the 1 million residents here as a third of the population live right along the coastline. Arde Edward wants coastal communities to embrace vertical evacuation. The three-storey school is the first building made for this purpose. 15,000 people can flee up to the roof from the tsunami. Though he concedes there's a lack of appropriate building material and a dependence on foreign donors to make these buildings. Hopefully next year there will be about six units of these escape building coming from international donations. For now, we have one. Soon, every public building such as schools and hospitals will be next. And the government official responsible for infrastructure believes 40 buildings are required for vertical evacuation to work here. So far, they can only finish one building a year. We need some place to be free for building some uh, uh, vertical evacuation building. Okay? But uh, if you know, the, all the place along the coastal area is very dense. Very a lot of people live there. So I think uh, this is the, uh, the very uh, hard work for the city government. Fleeing by foot along evacuation roads is currently the only viable escape route out of Padang. However, only two of the four roads are built, and if clogged with cars, they could be death traps. Of more concern, the provincial government says this road system will take a decade to complete. Based on the situation right now, considering the budget of the government, considering the situation of the land to be free for set up or to complete their all infrastructure, I think it takes at least 10 years to complete all the infrastructure for uh, anticipate the tsunami. Okay, for I think I am the infrastructure man. Okay, okay. If you're talking about infrastructure, it takes time. If we're talking about infrastructure, we're not talking about one month or two years, okay? We're talking about five, ten or twenty years. One grassroots NGO, Kogami, who educate about disaster preparedness, say only 40% of communities are ready. As many people don't understand the basics of the tsunami warning systems currently in operation. We only have one big siren from the MG and that cannot cover all the people in Padang, only about 700 meter radius. And also we have nine small sirens and also cannot cover all the city. And also people cannot differentiate the sound of siren with the ambulance siren. The organization run disaster simulations at 30 schools. They urgently want to roll it out across the province but for the last 18 months, they've had to wait for government approval. We still have 230 schools don't have this program. And even though like international NGO or UN agency give us uh, funding, but that's like limited, you know, so we have to go to maybe 10 schools for each funding. So that's very limited and take long time. Dr. Febrin Anas Ismail, an earthquake engineer with expertise in disaster management, believes all levels of government remain reactive to natural disasters. Tougher building codes, more community awareness programs and upgrades to existing buildings are all immediate approaches that could be adopted now. If we can make some uh, strengthen or retrofit yeah, the existing one, I think we can make as the vertical evacuation. So, in this case, government should support this concept. Otherwise, he fears that Parang will be ground zero to a disaster bigger than Aceh. 500,000 people stay in red zone. Yeah, this is under five meters from the uh, main sea level. To transfer this 500,000 yeah, in time, yeah, 
to a safe area, I think um, if it's coming within five years, almost impossible. Ada Edward is also aware that the clock is ticking, but he says it will all come back to funding from the Indonesian government. Every year there is limited budget allocation. We don't only organize the mitigation or disaster management. At the national level, the budget allocation for this is still very low. It's little solace for victims still shaken from last year. With the shore a five-minute walk from her house, Rosniati has grave doubts that Padang is ready. Authorities say look to the sea and when the tide is out, prepare for a tsunami. We will try to save ourselves by running, but I'm scared because there are no big buildings around here. Coming up after the break, we find out if Indonesia is prepared for its next natural disaster. Stay with 101 East. And welcome back to 101 East. This week we come to you from the city of Padang in Sumatra, Indonesia. It was a year ago that a massive earthquake hit this region, claiming over a thousand lives and destroying homes and infrastructure. Joining us now on the panel is Patra Rina Dewi from Kogami, a local NGO dealing with disaster preparedness. Also on the panel is Sugimin Pranoto from the National Board for Disaster Management here in Padang. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Pat Sugimin, if I can start with you, mm -hmm. let's talk about the recovery of yeah. Padang and Western Sumatra. Mm -hmm. Has this region fully recovered a year on from the natural disaster? Uh, not yet, because we have uh, developed what uh, we call a two years action plan. So it is still one year. So one year's uh, uh, implementation uh, regarding the housing improvement. And the next year will be emphasized on the infrastructure development. Patra, are you happy with the government efforts in terms of recovery for this region? I think the government already trying to do their effort, but we have to admit that we have lack like, of facility. Like this, you see the rubble, we don't have enough equipment, like heavy equipment, so nothing can be faster. Now, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono has called for stricter regulations when it comes to building. How do you monitor those regulations? Actually, the uh, local government has uh, certain regulations, mainly for the building codes. Yeah? But the question is, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, contractors build the building, the control of the uh, building improvement is not so enough. So that's why sometimes the construction is not fixed with the uh, building code. But actually, we have building codes and building permit. Well, Patra, if that's the case, then how do you ensure that people actually stick to these building codes, that they stick to these standards? People know that they have to obey to the regulation, but if there is no control, so you can do everything you want. Like, if I have a house, I want to develop my house, so no control me. There is no one controlling me, so I well, can develop the case, anyone. No, 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 actually, I'm not like that, yeah. Who controls <laughs> that? Yeah. I mean, who is the one who's supposed to enforce these controls, these regulations? Yeah. Why isn't the local government looking after this? Yeah, yeah actually, the uh, local government has uh, we call DINAS uh, uh, Human Settlement Office. His office is responsible to control all the building uh, construction. But for the uh, house, uh, people house community uh, improvement, I think it's a little bit different. It does not belong to the uh, uh, office of uh, human settlement uh, uh, responsibility. So you're saying that bureaucracy basically is stopping people from living in safe houses? Uh, yes. That's what you're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Patra, if that's the case, how do you think this can be overcome? How can this problem be overcome? Government has to make really good regulation, not only regulation. They have to have responsibility to control everything. They, uh, they, we make the regulation to make people understand. But then if people has opportunity to break the regulation, so who will be responsible? Again, back to the government. Now, experts have been predicting that another 
major earthquake will hit this region at any time now. Pat Sugimin, if I can ask you this question, do you think the community is now better prepared to deal with a natural disaster compared to a year ago? Yes, I, uh, I thought that the uh, people and community now are fully aware about the uh, disaster preparedness because they... Uh, they may be fully aware, but are they prepared? Do they know what to do? Do they know where to go? Yeah, because uh, so far the government has been provided uh, training activities, disseminating the, uh, 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 again, the disaster threat, and then uh, also we provide the uh, uh, kind of training modular, and then also sometimes we uh, provide curricula in the uh, university and private uh, school. It is uh, there's a lot of training and there's a, a lot, lot of, of curriculum yeah. and a lot of information that's going out yes, there. That's right. But is it being soaked up? Is it being accepted? Is it being implemented? Yeah, it is. Uh, I think not. <laughs> it is uh, should be should be may not monitored actually. Yeah, but. Well, who's responsible is it? Whose responsibility is it to monitor that this information is being implemented? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Government, local government. Local government meaning the uh, kabupaten or district level and city level. Responsible to monitor. How far the community already aware about the uh, uh, pre disaster preparedness. But so far, government, local government have been provided the uh, uh, activities dealing with uh, disaster preparedness. Like, uh, Establishing the early warning system and providing the uh, uh, information through media. Then uh, also we uh, uh, create the new technology to build buildings in order to save the uh, earthquake. Patra, it seems that there's a lot of information that's yeah. out there. There's a lot of courses that people can definitely take to prepare themselves for the next natural disaster. But is that information going down to the right people? Are the community, will the community be prepared for the next natural disaster? Actually, talking about disaster preparedness is not that as simple as that. You know, if you just give information, sort information to the people, people won't understand. Mm -hmm. Even though you already installed the early warning, but if you cannot if you don't come to the community and explain to them how the, uh, the mechanism and how they should respond, the people don't understand. So we have to come to the community, assist them at least six months. But up to now, I don't see that activities from the government initiative. Are you saying then that millions of dollars have been spent since the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami? Millions of dollars, billions of dollars have been spent to try and prepare communities for the next natural disaster, but they're not prepared. Uh, we can say that community now has knowledge, but no, not all of them know how to do the <coughs> appropriate response. Because they know that we already have technology, we already have, uh, I mean, warning system installed. But they know how they don't know exactly how to respond and where to go, because a different area has different route, so they have to train, they have to try to test the route. But not all the community in Padang do that kind of simulation yet. We're talking about local community here, but what about emergency response teams? How prepared are they when it comes to actually responding to emergencies? Pat Sugimi. Yeah, some time coordination in, in place, yeah, is a little bit uh, uh, problem. But actually, this is uh, belong to the uh, uh, central level and uh, regional level government. Again, it seems like bureaucracy seems to be getting in the way of saving people's <laughs> lives. Patra, would you agree with that? <laughs> nah, and also we have obstacle, you know, like we just established our emergency management office in Padang City like one year. So everything new. This is the obstacle, you know. So we cannot see the. We cannot say that SOP is already in place. So it seems how then, to implement it. Well, it seems then that if experts are right, and if another natural disaster was to strike this particular region, this region would not be prepared for it. Yeah, maybe thirty percent. Only thirty percent. So you're expecting more fatalities then. <laughs> 
No, actually, to make uh, community realize, make community aware, it is not so easy. We, we have to uh, provide information uh, many times to them. With Indonesia experiencing natural disasters pretty much every year, why do you think Indonesia is not leading the world when it comes to emergency response and relief? Because we just shift our paradigm from emergency response to disaster management, holistic, like uh, before, then during emergency and after emergency. So we just learn about that. But then sometimes for NGO, we are a bit frustrated, you know, because if we have lack of uh, support and commitment from the government, so we cannot do anything because they have authority. Like Kogami, for example, already tried to uh, help the government to make curriculum for school. But now, just to sign the legalization, we need to wait until one half year, you know. Are you then saying that despite Indonesia being on the Pacific Rim of fire, uh -huh. the Indonesian government is not putting disaster preparedness, preparedness as a priority? Yeah. No, no, I think it's not so true. Actually, the uh, government uh, uh, paying attention to the uh, preparedness activities. Yeah. They are. Yeah. But again, as you said, bureaucracy is getting in the way. Sometime in the field level, like uh, in, in case in Padang, uh, monthly we conduct uh, general coordinating meeting with the line agencies, international NGOs, something like that. So actually in the level, it's good enough, but sometime in the uh, central level, coordination between the line ministry, uh, uh, concerning the budget allocation, how to coordinate, how to put the budget into the uh, uh, line agencies sometime, uh, not so uh, uh, running well. Actually, mostly the reason is always budget, you know. <laughs> if you come to the government and they will say that we don't have any budget. Uh -huh. So, yeah. if they don't have budget, that means they don't put as a main priority. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. And that's all the time we have for this edition of 101 East. You can always follow the program via our website, Facebook, and podcast. From all the team here in Padang, Sumatra, Indonesia, thanks for watching.